Think you know everything about parcel shipping? Think again. This is ProShip ParcelCast, the only podcast hyper-focused on parcel shipping for supply chain and IT professionals in the retail, e-commerce, manufacturing, third-party logistics, and healthcare industries. Welcome to today's episode. All right. Welcome, everybody, to the 29th episode of ParcelCast. This week, we're going to be talking about the WMS conversation, inventory, reporting, visibility, and AI. I'm Justin Kramer, your host. With me today is Mike Mullane. Mike, can you give us a brief introduction of yourself? <clears throat> sure. Thanks for having me, Justin. appreciate the time. Mike Mullane, I work for Fog Software. I run the warehouse solutions portfolio in particular, and we have a number of business units that operate in that space. A lot of them are WMSs, if you will. Just a quick run through Sphere WMS, Cadre, Argo Software, ASC Software, DPS, which was a recent acquisition. Velocity is another one, so on and so forth. So the list keeps on growing. I've been with Fog for about two years. I came over in July of 2021. I was former CEO of Sphere WMS. That was a company that I was a part owner in. Ran that company for a better part of 16 years, if you will. So I've been in the WMS space for quite some time. And many of our listeners already know who I am, Justin Kramer, a co-founder of ProShip. Been in the small partial shipping industry for about 22 years. Lucky enough to be able to sell, design, architect, and deploy systems across four continents, some of them exceeding a million transactions a day, some of which are exceeding 110 million shipments per year. So Mike, it sounds like between the two of us, we've got a lot of experience in that warehouse world and in that enterprise software stack that so many of our listeners use. Let's go ahead and jump right into some of the challenges that face warehouse users and that WMSs can solve. And one of the largest one of those is going to be labor. Could you talk to our listeners about some of the things you're seeing with the labor challenges and how they can use their WMS to at least track, if not solve some of those problems? Yeah, no, great question. When you when you purchase a WMS or you have a WMS, you're obviously focused on labor and efficiency and how can I get the most productivity and the most accuracy, if you will, out of your workforce. That's always been one of the big things for WMS, but I think it's taken an interesting, more important turn relative to COVID-19. Really, two dimensions on that. COVID-19, We actually, I just read an article this morning that I think in CNBC that the great resignation has ended. And the data now in terms of the voluntary a quiet quitting or whatever you want to call it has ended and those that data has returned to pre-COVID levels, if you will. So it seems like we're coming out of it, but labor is still a massive challenge for our customers. It's how do you retain that labor? How do you make it easy to work? I've seen a lot of creative solutions from customers over, particularly over the past six to 12 months, if you will, where you might be engaging what I would consider non-traditional workforce, part-time workforce, really flexible hours, really any way you can get any kind of non-traditional shifts, if you will. So I think a couple of years ago, you would typically say, is your warehouse running you know, one shift, two shifts, or three shifts, thus being seven by 24. Now we're seeing a lot of flex shift type behaviors from that. Another thing that's pushed it is cost of labor has gone up. Obviously, inflation is the big story that everyone has been talking about over the last year where things just get more expensive and thus the labor gets more expensive. But particularly to the warehouse space, you also have the notion of e-commerce, where maybe five years ago, you were purchasing something, going to the store, going to a Walgreens, going to a retail store. And now over time, now you're finding yourself just clicking on your phone. You've had a lot of movement to Amazon, obviously, So if you're a warehouse operator and let's say you're operating in Columbus, Ohio, and all of a sudden an Amazon distribution center opens up right next to you. Now, instantaneously, you're competing just to hold on to your labor because they're going to pay a premium and then all wages go up. 
So it's even harder. Tension's a big thing. People want to, they're working a shift. They want to be able to come in at 7.30 in the morning, leave at 3.30 in the afternoon. That That is, like I said, it's always been, labor's an always key thing to look at, but now it's even taken on a, big, a bigger dimension. So anyway, bringing it back to the WMS, what does that mean? Obviously, labor productivity, reporting, access to information is a huge thing. Ease of use in terms of the UI is another thing. And also training. Um, a lot of the labor has a higher turn rate. You might more temporary labor, more seasonal labor, whether they're going to scan inventory in for a put away or a pick. You need to be able to train people up very quickly. They don't have time to go to a training class. You're going to have to train them on the floor and you want to get them up and literally up and running within a couple hours. And you have to do it very quickly because that labor might not stay with you, especially if it's temporary labor, maybe a month, two months, if you're talking about holiday season. Huge pressure for us and huge pressure for our customer base. Yeah, many of our listeners know that from the shipping side, we always recommend automation, but automation isn't always just let's put robots or conveyor solutions. Automation can be a lot about the way we pass data from system to system. It can be about applying the business rules and especially with, as you mentioned, temporary labor who don't know all of the ins and outs and why business rules were created the way they were, making it so that they get to focus on what they can, which is picking good, clean product, making sure it's packed properly, all these things that don't involve the tribal knowledge of a particular warehouse. But as you were talking about flex time and non-standard shift work, if you will, somebody may not want to be in from the 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. shift that you guys would normally have. Instead, they want to shift that forward due to child care, elder care. Maybe they're having to support two jobs and they're going to go from your warehouse over to the Amazon warehouse later that day. A lot of being able to move that data is important, but it also, to me, sounds like it would change the way we traditionally work with a WMS. It sounds to me like doing old school waving would no longer really work. Do you have an opinion on whether or not, can we continue to use the old school waves or do we need to go to the to more of a continuous solution on that? Or am I take, making a mountain out of a molio? That's a good question. I guess my take on that would be supporting the life of the order, if you will, wavings relative to who do you have available and when do you need to get that order out? So does that the easy example is, does that order need to move just in time? You obviously want an efficient use of warehouse labor to pick multiple orders at the same time, but also what's the class of service? Are you Do you have product that you are going to consolidate onto a full truckload LTL, or are you competing with Amazon where you have a DTC brand and you're trying to fulfill next day, really two day? Right. At the same time, uh, Justin, in your world, you're trying to keep the cost of the freight down, the cost of the packages down. So there's a balance between the two. One leads to the other. My argument is going to end up being more continuous depending upon what markets you're going to serve and how many pickups do you have to do and what do you want to do to fill those trucks. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. And, and I see from the shipping software side, many of us in shipping software have been able to solve the other end of that equation. If you can't do a wave to pick, you're clearly not going to be doing a wave to ship. And if you're, you may have more workers overlapping between, let's say, 5 p.m. and 8 p.m. because of just the way the labor is working, that is exactly the time where we see trailers being pulled, last trailers for the day. And having great algorithms in the shipping software can really ensure that you continue to take advantage of that labor while it's there, shifting trailers to tomorrow where, where they've already been pulled for the last time today, but still taking advantage of the trailers that are gonna be pulled today to try to drive down costs and allow you to, if needed, run a 24 seven solution that really makes trailer pulls relatively irrelevant to the way the individual labor parties are working. Let's move on to the next one, which is space. Now, as we all know, the last couple of years, warehouse space has come at a premium. I have seen some indications that some people are pulling back, especially 
Walmart and Amazon are slowly canceling some of their contracts. They're letting others expire. They're slowly, not aggressively, but slowly backing out of the space wars, if you will. But there's only two things for somebody to do if they need space. Make better use of the space they've got or get more. Is there any way that the WMS can help with that? And do you have any opinions on the, I won't call it a space war, on the competition for space? That's what I'm looking for. Yeah, I had a customer probably about 10 years ago that worked for a large 3PL and came to me and said, I need to know what I don't have. A lot of customers come to me and say, you need to help me find my stuff, which is a very elemental statement. It's also very shocking how we all struggle with that sometimes. But the 3PL was really wanted an empty bin report. And it sounds so simple, but it's so true. And really, it's how much uh, across their warehouse assets, you're talking millions of square feet of assets, domestic U.S. or North America, and really gun gunning for higher utilization. So that it was not so much looking for what you had, but what you didn't have. And there, is, there still is a lot of focus on, okay, what do I have in my system, how inventory counts, uh, min, max, whatever, but just as important to say, okay, what space do I have available? And then how do I reconfigure my warehouse so I can maximize that available space? Even if it's things such as, okay, pallet positions, and you're not completely filling up those pallet positions, how do you optimize that? How do you combine that inventory? It's a constant problem. I see still a lot of pressure on that as the cost of real estate, cost of build, whether you're going to lease space, it's just at a premium. The other thing from space is movement into secondary markets or what I consider non-gateway cities or something that's in close proximity. If you're talking about gateway cities, I forget the current stat, but was it 23% or 25% of the goods that we consume as U.S. consumers typically comes through the port of Long Beach. And then you start thinking about major ports such as Seattle, Oakland, Elizabeth, New Jersey, Savannah, Georgia, and so on and so forth. But seeing a lot of customers move into the tertiary markets where the cost is a little bit more tenable, and then trying to figure out through software, whether it's WMS or some what ProShip offers is, okay, how do I still meet the business need of, let's say, two-day shipping, but also do that in a, an area where the real estate is more tenable? And also, by the way, when you get to middle America or flyover country, the cost of labor is a little bit different. I live in Denver. Sphere WMS was founded out of Los Angeles. There was a lot of arbitrage, especially when you got to software developers 10, 15 years ago. And unfortunately, post or during COVID, everybody wants to move to Colorado. And they didn't leave. But yeah, space, lot, lots of moving to different areas. Number one, moving to different areas just to get a lower cost of real estate, cost of labor, but then also at some point in time, you're going to have to be in those gateway cities. You're going to have to be placed accordingly. And for that, are you truly utilizing that space appropriately? The other thing too, another thing that's interesting between Europe and North America is in terms of going vertical, we still have a lot of land and we obviously go vertical in terms of racks, but we ha haven't seen a lot of building multi-layer warehouses is starting to happen but when you go to europe you've got to go vertical much much quicker because the space constraint is a, just a different story no i agree with you completely it's interesting when i think about the warehouses i've toured the only place where i've seen warehouses that aren't one or a, you might say two stories with air quotes around it because really yeah. that second story is a is a mezzanine with a bunch of conveyor, it's not so much a true second Correct. floor. The only place I've seen real multi-story buildings is in the New York City area where these companies have been founded and they have same day, sometimes same hour delivery in that city along with multi-day delivery to the rest of the country. So it, it is interesting. Another thing that I think of when you talk about where the space is affordable, in the Midwest and in, in some of the non-coastal areas of the country, let's say. But we did find during the pandemic that ran into a different problem. 
there's only so many people living in those areas. So as we talked about in the labor portion of our conversation, when you do select those warehouses that might be in lower cost real estate areas, are you going to be able to attract the labor to actually utilize that warehouse to its fullest ability? And I found this one to be very odd in Pennsylvania. There's a shoe company that ships out and they basically have to hire people from two, three towns around it to actually hit their labor requirements. And I think that, I think we saw that really strong in the, in the pandemic when a lot of people removed themselves from the labor pool, but it's still something that I think that shippers should think about that balance of that availability of labor along with the availability of space. Absolutely. And to be contrarian just for a second, as long as you can attract the necessary amount of labor in those ter- the secondary markets, I would also challenge this, challenge it and say you might find out that your turnover rate on labor might be lower. Mm. That what you're offering, the job that you're offering in Missouri versus the same job in, let's say, Los Angeles, you might get a little bit more stickiness of labor. Obviously, you need to do basic things as a company and as managers to retain that labor, but I wouldn't immediately obviously if you're going to open up a distribution center of let's say a half a million square feet yes you absolutely need to look at that you've got amazon if they open up a distribution center it's what 800 a thousand people and, and that's on top of the kiva robots so another going back to space for a second justin is and i have seen this somewhat but it i think it begs the question what about vacant retail space So you have vacant retail space that's not going to be backfilled by traditional retail. I think we're somewhat at a crossroads here where you have, whether it's private equity or whoever the real estate investor is, they purchased retail space to be retail space. And is that going to get moved to a different owner? But when is that? That retail space is really well situated from a location standpoint. They're in neighborhoods. So do you start turning those into distribution centers? I personally think I've seen it happen in a bunch of markets successfully. The question that begs the question is, will that become really more mainstream? I still think the market needs to merge a little bit because what you would typically think in terms of retail per square footage for warehouse space versus per square footage for retail is a little bit different, but it begs the question, is that going to hit some sort of equilibrium point? And are we going to see Amazon trucks now or something, Amazon competitor trucks coming out of the back of a Kmart or a Sears? Mike, you're correct. And we used to, during the pandemic, there was a much stronger reference to the term dark store, which is very similar to ghost kitchen. We've seen in the Uber Eats, the DoorDash world, that these ghost kitchens can make for five or six different food brands. But what we're interested to see is anybody going to get in the 3PL world to take over these, I'm looking at old Boston store, Carson Perry Scott, if you will, right outside my window here at a mall, which is slowly shutting down portion after portion. That's thousands of square feet. It's multi-level as we have mentioned before, (laughs) right? How many different groups of inventory can you put in here in order to provide same day service to the local greater Milwaukee area where I'm at, right? Because that you'd be able to cover the whole thing with as little as one hour delivery. But it comes down to the question is, can you put the right inventory at that dark store in order to fulfill it that way? And I think that's gonna be one of the more interesting conversations that we have throughout the rest of the 2020s, which is where do we put inventory? Which is going to lead us into our next one. And I'm going to, I'm making a really bad segue here, but our next conversation is warehouse demographics. And Mike, you've got this history as to where we started back in the early 2000s and where we are now. Could you walk our listeners through some of that? Yeah, no, I've been, like I said, I've been in in it for 
probably 20 years now. And when I came in, e-commerce was just starting to get rolling. It's always been the topic and it's accelerating from there. But typically from a warehouse demographic perspective, you had, you, you'd have stuff coming in from suppliers and that would go out to stores, brick and mortar, and those would go out to store, store orders. Then you moved to, when e-commerce showed up, it was really, how can we take those assets and also continue to fulfill the store orders, but also fulfill the e-commerce and lots of different models with that. And that's still happening. We help customers all the time with that. And it's at, at its essence, we help people move boxes and, and but obviously it gets really complex really right quickly. But now you have the growth of D2C brands direct to consumer where the brand never existed in a store. It never was in brick and mortar. It just showed up on a Shopify site or an Instagram or now TikTok, which I don't think I bought anything yet off TikTok, but I'm sure it's going to happen. And then you have following suit with that, you have these fulfillment centers that are just servicing DTC. That's what they do. They don't even think about store orders, the complexity of that. It's just, it's, we're going to, you bring us your stuff. We'll fulfill it. We'll, it, it also includes packaging, personalized experiences so that you're on brand and it comes with all those suite of services. So it's definitely, and also I've seen this a lot too, where you have e-commerce companies that they start with the storefront. They're selling to these DCC brands and they're saying, I can get you traffic. I can get you paid traffic for SEO traffic. I can get you placed on all these platforms. We have the order management and they do all that, that hard work. And then they look at the warehouse side. So we'll just do the, we'll do the warehouse side. How hard could it be? Some of them do well and some of them do not so well. Interesting, Shopify just had a little bit of an exit from that space which is interesting. But uh, yeah, definitely now we have these different swim lanes of different uh, distributions and the demographics of where those team, where those, where that ownership came from and how they're funded. It's, uh, it's a little bit different. On one side of the spectrum, we have warehouses that support digital only brands. They don't do anything to stores. Then on the other side, we have some customers that are in the grocery business and have been in the grocery business since the late 1800s. And huge distribution centers, if you will. So they definitely tracked out. So a warehouse is not a warehouse is not a warehouse. It depends mm -hmm. on what commodity you're moving. And then those commodities typically track onto what channels they're going through for distribution. And then where are orders coming from? If we go way back, I was just sitting here thinking about this. I remember to me, the first, the evolution from catalog went to the TV sales, went to the order now, allow six to eight weeks for delivery. And that was like the first evolution from catalog to more of an e-tail solution. And then those things very quickly and almost overnight, it seemed in the early 2000s, went from that operators are standing by, to go to triple dub, buymystuff.com, which of course led to the direct consumer warehouses and things of that nature. But you're right, we have seen those purpose-built retail fulfillment DCs and the direct consumer DCs, most of our customers have merged all of those. And it's very rare to see a single use DC. One box could be going to store 127. The next box is going to be going to Will Smith, whatever, right? Whatever the case may be. So it's interesting how we've actually removed some of the specialization. And it makes me think of the Incredibles 2, where the father is saying math is math, right? Inventory <laughs> is inventory. So wherever you have that inventory, move it to where it's being sold. Whether you're moving that through a retail movement, a inventory redistribution, or whether that's a final mile directly to a consumer, inventory is the way I think that the market is starting to see that. Yeah, you're right, Justin. When in People were setting up saying inventory moves on e-commerce different than how it moves to to store. Okay, get that. So you're, you're first going to make the argument of it, they're just different business processes. Those warehouses should be separate. So whether, and they might have to be in different locations as well. So let's say if on the e-commerce side, if you want to make play the two-day game and that's the business that you're in, 
And for some commodities, you're going to have to do that. So you uh, have to start with, okay, where's my West Coast as asset going to be? And where's my East Coast asset going to be? So I can hit the Eastern Seaboard and up and down the West Coast. And people were making those decisions and saying, okay, they're two different assets. Yet we go back to the earlier topics we discussed in this podcast. All of a sudden, now you're setting up, what, two warehouses, two needs for space two labor forces and then the operation people go this is expensive and they're complaining they're not getting the right utilization so that's where you start to say maybe we should take a look at this because we'd like to use a combined labor force we'd like to use the same assets and then that's what we're seeing right I, i still argue that location is relative to where your end customer is and how and at what speed or scat code if you will how do you need to get it there I haven't seen, if you're running both, you're starting to see more consolidated assets, if you will. Even if you segregate that within the same facility, you want them close so you can, once again, maximize the space. Absolutely agreed. Absolutely agreed. Many of our regular listeners to this are somewhat familiar with WMSs, somewhat familiar with ERP, somewhat familiar with the entire enterprise software stack. This is one of those things we talk about a lot. But could you do us a favor here and for my listeners who are more into shipping, more versed on actual parcel execution, LTL execution, could you educate our listeners on the WMS market itself, depending upon the size of company they are or the specialization they might have, what type of WMS should they be looking for? I break it apart by size is an easy way to think about it if you want to say tier one tier two tier three in the economics involved so tier one would be the known entities the big boys if you will the manhattans of the world blue yonders so if i want to date myself i'd say red prairie there's other names but we'll just stop there you could probably throw high jump in there with the acquisition of corver if you want to call them tier ones so you know, it, those guys established lots of functionality, a cost that's commensurate to that. There is definitely an investment and it's more of a longer term CapEx play. And it, my advice to folks is how big is your operation and can you take advantage of that as a performing asset on your balance sheet? And then also with that, really 35%, in my opinion, of the WMS market is containerized inside what are called big ERP, you know, oracles, SAPs, et cetera. So where fund where you've made a decision for your company to purchase that ERP, it's the right decision. And then where you would handle the warehouse management through a bolt-on module. It might not be a best of breed solution per se, but from an economic standpoint, you've decided to purchase that as a bolt-on module. So that's typically 35%. Then you get to tier two, tier two, let's say you, you have a lot of feature functionality. That's where actually our portfolio typically sits. Price comes down, it's more accessible. And that's more of the, in terms of the SMB market, that's more of the M or the MB in the market. And it goes from anywhere you might have one warehouse location, multiple warehouse locations. You could do, if you wanna buy the software and install it on your server, there's still plenty of options out there. If you want to go SaaS, you can do that as well. So that's typically tier two. It's not, no no longer the million dollar expenditure that you typically see with a tier one. You typically see mid mid six figures ish, and then and go down from there. Tier three, what I would refer to is typically entry level type of inventory management solutions where if you've got a small set, let's say 20,000 square feet, 5,000 square feet, you don't want to make a capital investment, you're not comfortable with it. If you want to do something that's maybe a monthly subscription or maybe like an app where there's no longer term commitment, you can buy it off the shelf. You can do a couple things, but you typically can't, you don't get the flexibility in terms of you want to do customizations or if you, you know, the reports are canned. So those are generally, in my experience, how markets are segmented out. And then from there, obviously, it spreads into niches, if you will, or tracks to industry where some, especially for our portfolio, we've got some companies that are good at e-commerce. Some other companies are good at medical 
specifically contract, the contract manufacturing, where there's a lot of FDA compliance, cold storage, 3PL, depending upon what type of 3PL it is. Actually, we have one company, Argos, that actually focuses on nurseries and agricultural type stuff. So they do a really good job where you're doing seed to sale. So if you went down to Home Depot and bought a tree, that tree is being sold to Home Depot through someone who someone grew the tree. Maybe not necessarily a four-walled warehouse, but it's still inventory that needs to be tracked in the high-value commodity. So that's generally tier one, tier two, tier three. That's how, generally how it falls out. Yeah. So question here, because I see the tier one and the ERP solution the same in that you get what you get. You Maybe with the ERP included solution, you might be able to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to get them to make you some unique changes. But both of those solutions are pretty much it either works for you or it doesn't. As you look at the true tier ones and tier twos, you am I correct in thinking that they're going to be more flexible for you because they are one, many of them, especially the tier twos, are designed to be more flexible. And that's part of the revenue model of those companies in general. I know I'm generalizing here. <laughs> yeah, no, they definitely are more flexible for the most part. Most of those companies, those WMS companies, they will sell a vanilla based product with a lot of features and functionality. And then, but if you want to customize that or configure it more specifically uh, to meet your specific needs, whether you want to receive a certain way, ship a certain way, build a certain integration, those mid-tier companies will go there. Now, it's not necessarily a code rewrite, but it's configuration. So they're just more suited to build that and also support that through your life cycle. So it's everyone has particular needs in terms of how they want, want to run their inventory. Obviously, if you're a 3PL and you're especially a multi-tenant 3PL, and let's say you have let's say a quarter million, 400,000 square feet of space out in Torrance, California, but that's a multi-tenant warehouse. So you're servicing 20 customers. So each one of those 20 customers, they might have specific keys that you need to meet in terms of how you're gonna receive the product, how you're gonna label the product, how you're gonna allocate the product, so on and so forth. And maybe have different attribution that you need to store. Most of our companies do a really good job. And then that's where the economics come in play, where you can deliver a WMS that, that fits that need, inclusive of the professional services, but also works within that 3PL's economics of that deal. Everyone can profit from that and value is delivered. So it also works in a non-3PL manner. You've got, you're running a specific commodity and you've got certain things you need to track with that commodity or certain things you want to ship with that. You can get there. Honestly. For our companies, we actually find ourselves in accounts where there is already a tier one solution out there hmm. that's being used, but will they find themselves in different parts and pieces of the business where they can't customize that tier one or they can't customize that big ERP to meet those needs. So what they do is they bring in a tier two WMS as an additive play it might be standalone. It might integrate with the other companies so they can meet those particular needs. And the economics are, they work, right? They work. But usually what we see there is, can the bigger ERP or WMS do that? Yes, they can do that. They can pretty much do everything. But the economics of customizing it or time to value, it just one of the two just don't work. Where you, let's say if you need it inside of two to three months or even weeks. Actually, we had a couple of years ago, you know, we had a 3PL that was in a lockout scenario where the customer came to them and said, do you want my business? The customer unfortunately had a 3PL that was going under. The real estate company, the real estate owners were coming in, they're going to lock them out. And they had to move the inventory that weekend. It was not a small amount of inventory. So they needed, they had to come to us that at the time was Sphere WMS, come to us and say, can you stand up a system where we can get move the inventory, truck it over. And then ideally, when you move into a new facility, if you can get organized and have all your bin locations set up, you ideally want to scan that inventory in 
so you're ready to go. And we actually did that within a couple of days. We actually tried to use that as a marketing use case with other customers and say, hey, we're really good. We can do this in a couple of days. And the reality is it didn't really work too well because people just didn't believe us. And we even had yeah. the reference. I'm like, no, we can do this. I'm like, no, that, that's an outlier. Those are just examples of what what you can do to meet your business in the tier two in the tier two space. Sometimes you need all clad. Sometimes you just need a pan to actually cook dinner. This is what I'm hearing here. Is you didn't want to take the time. I'm going to, I'm going to use cast iron instead. You didn't want to take the time. You don't have the time to season it and warm it up and do all these things. These customers need stuff done. And tier twos have an ability to be able to get things done. Okay. Now that makes sense to me. Yeah. All right, let's, we're going to roll this back just a little bit more. I know we're going backwards and we're, we are simplifying. And I want to talk to my listeners that other than knowing that WMS means warehouse management system, they're not really sure why they would even need a warehouse management. This may be somebody that is, that is at either end of the spectrum that we just talked about. Maybe they're on Shopify and they're leveraging the inventory control inside the Shopify solution. Or maybe they're on SAP and they're just handling everything inside SAP and they're not even using SAP WM. So what are the primary pain points? What is the, as we, as I like to use the term, separate concerns, as we separate concerns in a growing organization, what is the real pain points that a WMS can solve for our listeners? Tagging back to some of your comments, Justin, Going back to SAP, and it could be, we shouldn't put pick on SAP, it could be SAP, Oracle, whatever. We do see a lot of scenarios where the something breaks down, right? You can't, accounting, one of the tenets of accounting systems is you shouldn't change them. Their debits, their credits, they, the balance sheet needs to balance, and your rate of change just, you shouldn't change the accounting system. So it's an, a con, contradiction terms when you put a WMS in. A WMS, you, the, what are the tenants in the accounting system? You buy stuff, you sell stuff, okay? You're gonna execute a purchase order and you're gonna receive goods against that purchase order or you're gonna sell stuff, which is a sales order, right? And then you're gonna send the sales order down the warehouse and someone's gonna ship some stuff out. But usually where we see the break point is, let's say you get, you need to get into details of allocation, you need to reconcile damaged inventory, just certain things, certain flexibilities you need in the warehouse to move stuff around to get to receive goods. And it just doesn't perfectly work like a accounting system. It's not just a debit and a credit. So we typically see a break, break or you need some extended functionality. You want to do more stuff on the scan gun. You need to different labeling requirements. You, as you get further down the best of breed, go ahead. Are you saying that the way accountants think a warehouse works is different from the way a warehouse works? And therefore their crazy. software may, crazy. Not, uh, may not meet yeah. the needs of a warehouse worker? Yeah, hopefully none of my accountant friends are listening to this podcast, but if they are, I apologize. Yeah, they're just different breeds. So usually we, in our sales pipeline, that we see a breakdown. We always have a certain percentage of that in, in all of our pipelines saying, hey, I'm currently running my inventory on anything from QuickBooks to SAP. It's just not, it, I'm just not getting it done or it's just too restrictive. And that's usually the big trigger. Other things that we see, let's get away from the accounting thing so we don't pick on them too much. But let's say you're running your inventory on a spreadsheet or would I, or you're running it on some homebrew system, which is fine. I see that a lot where you might have T staff, a programmer or access to a programmer that can create headers and line items and starts building stuff. And it all work, typically works for a couple of years, but then you keep on wanting to add more and more functionality. And that one person is pretty unhappy because they were first hired to build the system and now they're just maintaining the system and they can't do anything new. And they're just not keeping up with where the market is and feature functionality. So then your cost benefit, what you gained in the beginning by uh, doing it with internal resources, now you're being burdened by that. And you're not, your cost level might still be okay or might be happy with it, but you're not able to find your stuff. You're not able to get the reporting out. 
you're not able to service the customer's request. And that's usually, we see that a lot where it starts to kind of cave in on it on itself. Other things are things such as the theft events, product loss, shrinkage, insurance events, where let's say if you have to do an insurance claim, I live in Denver and every couple of years we get a heavy spring storm and you'll have a couple, unfortunately, warehouse roofs that will fall in. If you've got damaged inventory, and you want to submit a claim to your insurance provider and they want to know, okay, what was the value of the inventory at that period of time? Can you let us know so we can process the claim? And you don't know what the inventory was because it was sitting on a box on a piece of software that was inside the warehouse and it just, it's underneath the snow, right? So yeah. that's not good. So a lot of those scenarios that we, we see. Yeah, I want to go back to, to what you mentioned because you're right, we've seen that as well. Those homegrown solutions that start off, sometimes it's just an IT guy that says, oh, I can do, I can pull this information out of QuickBooks or one of your, uh, one of your SAP programmers is like, I can make a Z screen to do this unique thing that we need. We don't need to go out and order a whole WMS for this yet. And the thing that we found with that is often they're great. Half of what we connect to somewhere in the enterprise software stack is a homegrown solution. Sometimes you need that just to glue everything together. But as we all know, with a homegrown solution versus a commercial solution, the commercial solution is used to having built-in features that you don't really actually have to pay for, right? They just, they can be turned on or off as needed. Additionally, a commercial solution has a means of adding uniqueness rather than having to organically grow and therefore at some point in time have to be refactored as we call it in in software development rather than having to be refactored many commercial solutions are modularized in such a way that they can remove old components that don't work as well and put in new ones that meet the needs so whether they be speed functionality flexibility otherwise and if a homegrown solution was allowed the time allowed the uh, investment to actually refactor every couple of years, they wouldn't grow as long in the tooth as they do. But the reality is what starts off as that one guy who can code a Z screen and maybe put some RPG together or something like that. <laughs> three or four years later, he's the boss of three people. They don't know why he made that decision. And it becomes, for some companies, it becomes a burden, which is much cleaner with commercial off the shelf or commercial solutions that have had deliberate customizations to meet your need. Correct. Just wanted your thought on that. My, where my brain goes to is, you're absolutely right about refactoring code, but and maybe I'll date myself here, but if we wind back 20 years ago, you had applications running on Windows and all you had to worry about was making sure your application ran on the current Windows server or the current version of whatever windows operating system and we know how many people out there that had wouldn't let go of windows 98 so they are then you go to the web and you say i need to port my application to the web which we've done then you you're talking about okay which you have to write compatibility for not only multiple browsers but multiple versions multiple versions of a browser so whether you're I will admit I'm a Macintosh, or not say Macintosh person. I'm an Apple person, right? West person that my peers accuse, give me a hard time, but I'm running Chrome. But I'm running a Chrome browser on a Mac versus a Chrome browser on a, a Windows PC, little subtle differences. Or if you're a Microsoft person, are you running Edge? Or once again, for the fear of dating myself, Windows Explorer. So you have to write for all those platforms because that's where the eyeballs are. And that's where the people are. Taking it back specifically to the warehouse, Five years ago, all the scan guns were Windows Mobile, Windows CE. Everybody was on that platform. And Microsoft left the industry. They said, well, you know what? We're not going to do this anymore. So now everything is Android. So if you wrote that application for the Microsoft stack, now you've got to recompile it for an Android. So it's unfair for those IT folks inside those organizations. That's a lot to keep up with, right? So there is something to be said if you go with a commercial piece of software and you have a bigger base of customers for the software, for the WMS software provider to be in business, they've got to service all those stakeholders. So 
inherently they're just always going to be ahead of an internal IT department. Not to say those are good people, it just matters where you're in the market and what you're working on. And it's an economy of scale right now. And it's always, and then let's throw in security. Let's not forget about security. Security, yeah. huge topic in digital supply chain. You've got, is your, is it secure? What, how can you help a customer with their security audit? What password rules you want to put in place? Are you putting two factor on your application? Are you protecting yourself from supply chain attacks? Yeah. Like, so on and so forth. You, it's a very big issue, right? And something that as inside fog and fog, which is our parent in constellation, we do a lot of investment in on a continual basis. Yeah, no, I'm with you. I'm sorry. I've got to go back to the portable data terminals and I am positive. There are a hundred companies out there that are looking to buy any symbol 3600 series yes. Windows CE yes. terminal that they can find anywhere on eBay for exactly the reason that you're talking about, because the stuff still works. If they can get a working model, and they're probably Frankensteining a battery from one motherboard of the other into a case of a third. So it, it is amazing how these things that were state of the art back in the early 2000s, people continue to find ways to keep them going because they have to stop, rethink what they're doing, and they're going to have to change a lot of processes and things of that nature in order to allow them to do that. But let's blast into the future here. Okay, let's go to a topic that you and I are going to have to limit ourselves to 10 minutes on here. Otherwise, we'll talk for another hour. And that is, okay. that is AI. And I think the big question that everybody's got is, where will we see AI? Is it, are we going to see it in shipping software? Are we going to see it in this software, that software? Keeping with the scope of our conversation, are we going to see AI directly in WMS soon? Or what is your take on AI? Yeah, I think you're, it's not, you're going to see it in everything. That's my stance that that's not unique. Where we sit right now, obviously ChatGPT, generative AI is eating the world. If you're in the marketing side of our businesses, that is moving extremely rapidly. But let's take it over to really the warehouse operation. What does that mean? What does that mean for WMS software? So a couple simple use cases to just to think about. One thing I like to point to is, okay, chatbot, right? A lot of applications already have chat functionality, but now I think you would expect to see chatbots showing up inside applications where you can interact with your application through the chatbot and chatbots tap into all your data. So you can ask it questions as if it were a personal assistant and you can get meaningful answers from. that. That'll change things a lot. Another use case is let's talk about minimum inventory levels. So minimum inventory levels obviously is safety stock and you don't want to be in an out of stock position. So you know that's a piece where do we have that functionality triggers and can we set those levels inside WMSs? Absolutely. And then there's a whole other space where we have analysts and people that look at that stuff and they look at the data and they make decisions because there's money behind those decisions of, okay, I don't want to store too much stock because it might expire, but you can make a hard argument that things like that could turn into a virtual assistant very quickly where the AI just constantly looks at the data and then it spits out and says, Hey, this is where you should set your stock. Would you like me to do that for you? Where mm -hmm. let's say I'm personally very excited where you have, let's say you have a lot of, mid-market warehouse managers that have to do that work today and they don't have access to data analysts to to do that and now if they could pull up ai that could tap into that data and then treat it like a virtual assistant to do that work and make themselves look a lot better add more value i think that's coming so i think that's just one very simple use case i think that could be coming very quickly and then going down range you do have to ask yourself, I mean, for the last couple of decades in the world that Justin, you and I grew up in is an application is you're capturing someone's process, best practices into screens, into reports with data validation, 
Um, you're doing data transformation underneath of that application to do the in and out, but it's always it's very screen based. Going back to the chat by, if you take an ex expanded view and saying, does the notion of the interface go away to some degree? Can you start interacting with it in a different way? I think you know, Amazon Alexa was a good example. Of course, Amazon Alexa, just you know, I get to play whatever horrible 80s music I want to play. And it tells me when my next order is coming, but am I actually talking to Alexa as a human being? The answer is no. But now on these with ChatGPT and this other generative AI, large language models barred with Google, I think you're going that way. So you could see a dramatic shift over the next couple of years and, and at people taking a step back and saying, well, what's a user? What's a user interface? And then all of a sudden you'd still have the WMS and still have your shipping software, but maybe you would interact through that with through an api through a chatbot or some other type of interface that's just it removes some of the friction we don't even so it's, it's i think we're in for a paradigm shift very exciting time so two things number one i like your concept of, of what is the ui now i'm especially thinking here if we're dealing with orders we're dealing with all these other things we're dealing with let's face it if you're shipping you're dealing with a relationship especially if you're a 3PL or a manufacturer and you're shipping on behalf of a vendor who's ordered, there's a ton of information in emails. Maybe that AI gets access to those emails and say, oh, did you forget? Remember that Bob wanted this, something of that nature to help ensure that, that we hit 100% or we're more likely to hit 100% requirements the first go round rather than the second, third or fourth go round. But the other thing that you mentioned that I wanna go back to is, those warehouse managers that that don't have the time to really look at all those minimum inventory points, maybe they're able to get to that once a quarter, once a year, or even less. Because we know machines are ruthless, tireless, and will continue to go forward, that assistant that you're talking about could, in the morning email or in an interface or some other form, especially if we're re reimagining user interfaces completely, could be able to tell that warehouse manager, hey, I know you've been focused on these 10 SKUs or these 100 SKUs, but meanwhile, these other SKUs are starting to show signs that we should look at them. Do you want to approve my recommendations or not? And I can see a world where all of a sudden, once we've trained it, which is the whole thing about machine learning, machine learning is about how do you train the AI, which is the execution result of machine learning, that if we continue to have this AI machine learning circle, that we can grow the ability to not miss things in our enterprise organizations, because we will continue to have that enterprise's AI learn more and ensure that we're not, we're not looking at the top 25% of SKUs, we're looking at all the SKUs, we're not, just working for peak, which is what in the shipping software world, everything is about peak, right? But we are making sure that we're even efficient in non-peak times. You're end up, gonna end up feeding that data and eliminating the, what we'll see, I think in the next year, eliminating that administrative work. And honestly, being able to, and people say it's gonna eliminate jobs. I look at it a different way. Now you have the opportunity to level up those people and give them opportunity to move up and make decisions or they'll be prompted to make decisions from a managerial standpoint. So there's still a lot of administrative work that is, is going on in and around the warehouse and with shipping. A lot of that is, is compiling data, whether it's you're extracting, you're running reports out of the system or you're or trying to pull reports from different systems into spreadsheets and putting together a pivot chart and putting it into a PowerPoint deck and then get it, presenting it to a manager so that manager can make a decision. I think it's gonna accelerate, get rid of some of the mun, mundane work. I've seen this and I know you've seen this in the past. How many times have you been in a big meeting where the manager, spent so much time analyzing the data, putting together the presentation, and they're literally exhausted when he or she are exhausted when they walk into the room because they just put all their brain into trying to create, and they're not speaking to the deck. They're not just, and so that I think is an opportunity to get rid of that 
I don't think anybody wants to do that work. And I think you're going to get a lot more productivity out of that. And, and people will be excited, quite honestly. I agree with you. And I want to add something. I agree with you that this will shift workers, not so much make them go away. Sure, we don't have professional typists anymore. We don't have, or very few people have traditional secretaries anymore. Why? Because we all have our own laptops, right? We all have Word. We all have Outlook or some equivalent to help us set up our appointments. We don't need that person who doesn't get to add much value. But the other part of this is training, right? I look at the fact that AI can, you can interact with it. And if it's trained on the specifics of warehouse control on this other thing, it can help a person learn the right way to do that significantly faster. What does that mean? That means you can take somebody off the street and get them to the point where their brain is making more connections and they can help feed back into the AI process, right? So we are, rather than having, rather than having this huge gap between I just graduated college and I've read 300 books to where you and I now are, where it's been hundreds of warehouses, hundreds of successes and mistakes that have made up our knowledge base. If we can shorten that process and get those people, get these new workers, get workers who might have been coming from another, another area where, yes, automation has replaced those jobs. But if we can use AI to train them into other jobs faster with that tireless, relentless nature of what a computer can do, then we can put more people in more satisfying jobs and help them have a more positive impact on an organization than they would otherwise if they were left to try to learn by a dead tree format, if you will. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm jealous. So it's you're absolutely right. And it'll be exciting to see. All right. And with that, unfortunately, we have come to the end of our time here. Mike, we've talked about a lot of things. We've we've talked through labor concerns, space concerns, and then we've done an educational piece talking about uh, what has happened with warehouse demographics over the last two decades. We've talked about the WMS, the tiers in the WMS market. We've talked about what is a WMS? Why might you need one? And of course, we ended with the future with AI. Is there anything you would like to to tell our listeners? And by the way, feel free to go ahead and plug addresses and phone numbers, website addresses and phone numbers, I should say, as part of that. Yeah, no, I appreciate you having me on. I hope that some of the topics we cover that your audience will find value in. Hopefully, maybe you'll invite me back in the future. We Time will tell, if you will. But yeah, like I said, we run the warehouse solutions portfolio with a number of companies and different brands out there. If you want to always open to feedback and commentary or suggestions, the best way to get a, get a hold of me externally would be LinkedIn. Excellent. Excellent. Mike, thank you for joining us today. It has been very educational. I am sure that our listeners will send us some questions. And so we're going to have to do a follow-up at some point in time to answer listener questions. And so with that, Mike, thank you for attending today. And I'd like to thank our audience for attending as well. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for joining us for another episode of ProShip ParcelCast. If you'd like to learn more about ProShip multi-carrier shipping software, visit our website at ProShipInc.com or connect with a ProShip parcel expert via email at sales at ProShipInc.com or by calling 800-353-7774. Be sure to subscribe to ParcelCast on your favorite podcast platform so you don't miss any of our future episodes. And until next month, happy shipping.